Well, look at this. Black and white. Top of the pops. Now, this isn't quite the 1960s episode that I've been aiming to react to for a long time. But it's as close as we've come so far because this episode is dated. I'll just double check that I've written the date down properly. Yep, the 5th of February 1970. So this is the earliest Top of the Pops edition that there'll be a commentary or a reaction to on the channel so far. What a weird animation of Tony Blackburn there. Okay, so we're getting a rundown of the top 30 first. So it looks like Tony Blackburn's going to be the host. Ugh, Jonathan King. Are we going to recognise anything? So, yeah, um, I'm still aiming to do a 1960s reaction when I find a suitable edition. And um, this is... Um, Love grows where my, or love goes where my rosemary grows. It's maybe number one, so I think we played a bit of the number one at the beginning, back in uh, the late 60s and early 70s. Elvis at 12 there. Mary Hopkin, who was on the Apple label. Uh, I think a lot of her early stuff was, pro uh, was produced by Paul McCartney. Bad Finger at number five, another Apple band. I think they were at that stage, anyway. <laughs> Rolf Harris at two. Yeah, Edison Lights House, that's who does lo Love so Goes Where My Rosemary DJ Grows. Tony Blackburn. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just found it funny that he'd just sort of and, uh, appear out of thin air there. World famous kneecap warmers a little later on in the show. But right now, here's a lovely record, and it's uh, number 21 this week. It's called Venus, and it comes from Shocking Blue. All right, Shocking Blue and Venus, I do know this. Um, I'm expecting there's going to be some stuff in here that I'm not familiar with at all, because this is, you know, this was over 10 years before I was born, and yeah, I, have li I do listen to older music from the 1960s and some from the 70s. Um, so it's not like I'm totally ignorant as to everything that'll be here, but there, I'm, there's bound to be some stuff that I won't know, so just bear with me and look at the information bar or the ticker bar for all the info. So Shocking Blue, Venus, um, I'm more familiar with the cover versions of this, which were Bananarama in 80, 84, 85. Um, and Don Pablo's Animals, which um, some sort of dance music project. That was, I think that was maybe 1990. That. Uh, but um, the original is, is good. Good start. This I don't think we can count Edison Lighthouse, um, the number one yet. As I think we're going to hear that in, in a bit more of a fuller version later on. So I'm really excited to do this reaction. This is the earliest 1970s episode. And it's, what, 40-odd days after 1969 ended, so this is very close to being a 60s one. Right down to the black and white. Now then, uh, for what I know, this edition of Top of the Pops will have come out in colour originally. Uh, BBC started uh, producing colour television for BBC Two, first and foremost, in 1968, I think that was. And it would have come to BBC One, um, I think, maybe the year late, a year later. There would have still been a lot of people without colour television in 1970. I mean, even through to the 1980s, you know, there were still a lot of people getting black and white TVs over colour. Um, my parents, I remember them having a black and white TV as the main one um, for the first, you know, early years of my life. I don't think it was told about the mid-80s when we got our first family colour set. Um, I do think though that this is because the BBC had a policy of junking stuff throughout the 60s and a lot of the 70s really um, and we can see from the Iden that's on the top right this is from a foreign station this is from somewhere in Europe um, maybe Holland or Germany or somewhere like that so this is probably like what the, uh, the European channel has got in their archives the BBC 
who would have had the original colour transfer of this edition, along with many others, obviously uh, would have no doubt thrown that out at some point. Well, that's my theory anyway. I don't know for sure. Well, we didn't hear that. That must have been cut for copyright. Oh, leave it on a jet plane. Um, I do know this. I... Oh, well, we're not going to have it. That's another one that's cut for copyright. That's, that's a shame, though. I was going to talk about that. It's a John Denver original. We're going to judge during this one because we're going to see the kids dancing here in the studio. It's the number 30 sound, the first new entry this week, and the only new entry, Jackson's 5, and a number called I Want You Back. Well, we've got to hear this. <laughs> oh, we are. And it's a good song as well. Um, pity about leaving on a jet plane by Peter, Paul, and Mary. Um, I uh, do like the... I'm a, I don't know. That, I would, that felt... 1970 felt a bit early for that, but I, maybe it was a 60s thing from John Dunn. But anyway, um, no point talking about it, because we didn't see it. Uh, Jackson 5, I want you back. Um, if this wasn't their debut single, it was very, very close. I think they sort of come out in America, sort of 1969. Probably out in the UK in 69, and it's it's taken till February 1970 to to climb up into the the top 30 here. So yeah, we're just seeing some uh, dancers in the studio, uh, as was often the case. Uh, well, Pan, I think Pan's people were around at this point, so uh, I've got the feel a feeling we'll probably see them later on. There's a bit of a variety from. Looking at the studio audience, I mean, promo videos barely existed at this point, unless you were the Beatles and maybe one or two other bigger acts, really. I say it every time, and um, I'll say it again, I haven't watched this episode at all, I've just had a quick scrub through, just to check the quality. I knew there was some stuff edited out for copyright. Um, I won't say what the other one is that I think's been edited out, but um, uh, it's a bit of a shame for me. Apart from the other, I forgot what the first one was, and the second one was Peter, Paul and Mary. But um, what I will do, I will list all the stuff that was cut for copyright at the top of the video description. Um, so you can go away and check that out elsewhere. I mean, it'd be on YouTube somewhere, no doubt, uh, in a different form from uh, a Top of the Pops broadcast, no doubt. But uh, it's. Uh, I say it's not often I get to react to a full Top of the Pops episode. I've been fairly lucky with some of them, not having to take anything out myself or finding one and nothing's been taken out before I've even started. But. That's been a lot where I've uh, I've either had to had to cut tracks out, even with me talking all the way over, or they've been cut out, you know, prior to me downloading it. Uh, Jackson Five, I want you back. Great song, great single. Uh, it re-released a couple of times. I remember a slightly remixed version coming out around '88 that I always enjoyed. Good stuff that. Yeah, that was it, Lennon and Plastic Ono band, that was the one that, um, when I looked at an episode guide briefly, not for spoilers, just to kind of check the dates tallied, it was John Lennon that had been cut as well, from what I could tell when I scrubbed through. So, uh, I have to do a little bit of prep for stuff like this, and uh, you know, I thought it was handy for certainly for an edition like this where I'm maybe gonna be kind of on the flying by the seat of my pants, so to speak. That I uh, better look up a the episode guide and b just check what had gone. Uh, this is Billy Preston. Um, I, did, I was talking over Tony Blackburn's um, introduction, but I recognise Billy Preston. At the time of me recording this, it's not long after I watched the Disney Plus documentary, uh, three-part documentary series. God, it's about ten hours long as well. Uh, the Beatles Get Back and uh, Billy Preston, um, certainly from um, 
episode three of that. Was it episode two? Maybe towards the end. Definitely, it, it featured throughout episode three. Though he, of course, was uh, the piano slash keyboard player for the Beatles during the Get Back slash Let It Be sessions, and of course, the infamous Apple HQ or Apple Studios rooftop concert of uh, late January 1969. So, uh, Billy Preston, he was, uh, from what I could tell uh, when I was watching Get Back on Disney+, Plus, he kind of come over for a holiday to England, I know, coming on holiday to London in January 69, you know, it's going to be freezing cold, mate. But probably he was doing some promotional stuff as well, because, you know, it, it was an established... Um, artist in his own right, and he, the be he just visited the Beatles one day. They said, "Look, we're doing all this stuff, we're recording and rehearsing as a live band, but we need a keyboarder, keyboardist. We need a pianist, and you know, well, like a keyboardist, because Paul McCartney was playing a lot of piano at the time. You know, will you be our fifth Beatle for these sessions? And you know, that's why it's credited on the Get Back single, and the features on." much of, if not almost all, of the Let It Be album that would have come out um, a couple of months or so after this edition of Top of the Pops, around sort of March, April 1970, which was the Beatles' final studio album release, although it was recorded before Abbey Road, which came out, um, what was that, mid to late 69. Um, well, he's just kind of jumped up from his piano and now he's... Uh, now is it the um, is it the might a bit of a weird performance this, but I like Billy Preston. Um, I'm really only familiar with his work with the Beatles. Um, always seemed a really um, happy-go-lucky guy. Um, judging by I've seen him in other things besides Get Back. He's sort of featured briefly in the Beatles anthology, and I've got the Let It Be the original Let It Be documentary as well. Um, lovely fella, not a bad song. So, uh, no introduction for this, but it sounds familiar. Oh, I, I do know this. Oh. Hitching a ride! You know, I, I know why I know this. Because bloody Sonia of Stock Aitken Waterman fame, she covered this in around. Oh, I don't know, 1989, 1990. Uh, I, I can't tell you who the uh, who the band are. I mean, I will have told you in the info bar. But I do know the song. This is Hitching a Ride by the, these chaps here. And I can safely say the original is far superior to Sonia's version. I'm sure it was Sonia. Yeah, because I've got, I can sort of vaguely picture her miming along to this in on top of the pops. Funnily enough, um, did she get top ten with this? Maybe. She really got top twenty at least. So so far, I think this 1970 edition has been pretty good. The number one's decent, and I think we'll hear some more of that later, I think. Um, shame about the cuts, but it is what it is. You can't do anything about that, personally, I'm afraid. Um, but the stuff that we have seen, uh, Shocking Blue with Venus, Billy Preston was good, Jackson 5, great stuff. Possibly my favourite song of the evening so far. Um, and as I say, I mean, this would have been a colour broadcast, but... Um, whichever European TV network, Festival One, or I think that's a festival something. Um, they obviously had a black and white transfer of it, which has survived um, being junked, as the BBC policy was for many years, which uh, I know um, as an organisation they've you know, deeply regret doing a lot of junking. I mean, any Doctor Who fan of the classic era will uh, bemoan the BBC's junking policy. Uh, you know, they're still uh, scrabbling for, you know, col collectors and foreign TV channels to 
go through their archives to see if any missing Doctor Who episodes are still around. And some crop up from time to time, but uh, that's a process that's been going on for years. Well, that was good. Uh, Vanity Fair, did he say? Something fair. So we've got Pan's people doing a dance. I uh, didn't catch what the song was. But of course, it'll be on the screen. Familiar voice. It does sound a bit like Joni Mitchell, actually. If it's not Joni Mitchell, I apologise, and whoever it is will be on screen. But that's who, that's who the voice sounds like to me. Yeah, this is another song that I know. There's a lot of stuff that I know so far. Nothing that's been completely unfamiliar to me, really. Well, apart from the Billy Preston one, but I did enjoy it. But I am familiar with Billy Preston more, you know, his collaborations with the Beatles. And um, I think he had a number one with Cyrita. That was later, well, either... That was mid or late 70s, I think. He had quite a big hit. Um, like a duet. But... Um, it's obviously a ballet in, in inspired dance here from Pan's People, who I think they were the original Top of the Pops dance troupe, unless there was a more briefly tenured one that came before them. But when you say Top of the Pops dance troupe, Pan's People, particularly for anyone of a certain age, i.e. even older than me, will, um, will remember uh, Pan's People is the one they always say. Um, there was Legs and Co. Um, what's that one that was um, more towards the early to mid 80s? Uh, I've mentioned them before. It doesn't matter. But this is a nice song, and it's another one I know. I, could, um, I think it's Joni Mitchell. <laughs> I keep saying that, and I'm, uh, if I've had to correct myself earlier on about that, then uh, I'm still going to look a bit of a tit. So what's new? But. Um, I'm enjoying this edition. I think there's been some good music on this. Um, a lot of good music coming out of the late 60s, certainly, and a lot of this, obviously, would have been released in the in 1969. You know, um, stuff did steadily climb the charts uh, slowly, slowly but surely, a lot of the time um, for it, during this period. So. Um, it is for all intents and purposes a 1969 edition, but it isn't. And I will still endeavour to find the 1960s episode in good quality and preferably Jimmy Savile free. I mean, there's a lot of the ones in the 70s that have got Savile on them that I'm deliberately... I, I see it, I find them, and um, as soon as I see him, I just ignore it. It is what it is, isn't it? Oh, Judy Collins, stop Tony Mitchell. Hey, about a couple of weeks Oops. Ago, the, uh, very first so, um, yeah, we've got um, we've got something that's been muted for copyright now. So, uh, what I'll do, I'll uh, just edit all this out because there's no point in me sitting here <laughs> talking over <laughs> something that's um, <laughs> that's muted. So, so. Um, well, I'll, I'll still be here, but um, there'll be a jump cut now. So, uh, we're back. With, that was some sort of like basic promo video. And we've gone straight into another performance. I don't know who this is. Could this be... Um, I'm trying to think who was in the top 30. Um, the fact that I didn't see Joni Mitchell in the top 30 should have given me a clue earlier on. But, um, this might be Mary Hopkin, this. I'm not overly familiar with Mary Hopkins, so I don't want to speak too much on her in case this is someone else. Uh, 
Um, it's just, these are, I don't want to say a struggle, because it's a pleasure doing any Top of the Pops reaction, whether it's like something full of stuff I know, or like in this case, there's a lot of stuff that um, is out of my comfort zone. Um, but this is pleasant. Um, enjoy this attractive uh, lady singer here. Uh, so a lot of stuff will have been, um, well, we know there's already been three songs, three singles edited out and one muted for copyright, which I'll have um, edited all the silence out in uh, my own edit for this. Um, but I still think this episode is going to weigh in probably around the 30 minute mark, maybe even a bit more, which shows you that Top of the Pops was... Um, Till, I think till well into the 80s it was um, 40 minutes in length I mean they would have they, I'm used to Top of the Pops being a half hour show you know Thursday evening before EastEnders a lot of the time you know 7 o'clock till 7.30 but um, certainly some of the uh, a lot of the 1970s ones and a few of the early 80s ones I've done um, Without edits and everything, they've always weighed in around the 40 minute mark, and I think this one would be at least 40 minutes. Maybe at this stage it was even 45, I don't know. The very handy Top of the Pops episode guide website that I used for checking dates and, um, you know, just checking I've got the right, you know, I've, I've given the right credits for edited stuff and what have you. Um, I think they give the show length generally. Not very precisely, but, you know, they're not doing it in, like, so many minutes and seconds, you know. That's a bit <laughs> bit extreme, really. A bit anal, who were. Um, but um, if, if the, this is a 40 or 45 minute or whatever length edition, it will say on there. But, uh, yeah, I like this. Um, good stuff there. That was Sandy Shaw, not Mary Poppins. Right, okay. Temptations. I can't get next to you. There's, they're cramming a lot of stuff in, aren't they? I mean, this is kind of a golden era for Top of the Pops. They've got, you know, they've got a lot of big name acts. They've got a lot of familiar like big selling stuff and they, they fit in a lot of things in, in into one you know 40 minute or however many minutes I won't go on about that again episode this is but the Temptations I mean another well known act who they would have uh, what, did they even start out in the 50s the Temptations I don't know but I, I think it might be in early 60s but um, another you know, your, one of your Motown vocal groups, one of your soul acts that, um, you know, was successful in, in America and over here in Britain and no doubt much of the rest of the world as well. Uh, but this is alright, uh, you know, as performances go, the ones that they've been able to listen to or see in this edition, um, I would say this is probably like down near the bottom if I was ranking my favourites best to worst but there's nothing inherently wrong with this it's all it's fine it's just not really my taste in music was it Temptations who did My Girl yeah it must have been yeah. Oh yeah, let me know in the comments what you think about the 1970 February 5th Top of the Pops and whether you'd like to see more from this sort of really early 70s era. I've done a 1971 episode um, that was getting off two years ago now. God, shows how long this series has been running. And um, last year I did a 1973 edition. Enjoyed both of those. I'm always happy to listen to what other people want as well. Here's a guy who's come all the way from America specifically for the opening of a brand new film called Butch Cassidy and the Sundowners, in which he sings this particular number. So here's the original version, which has been top of the American hit parade for quite some time. It isn't quite there now, but it's been there for a number of times. Uh, Raindrops keep falling on my head from B.J. Thomas. 
BJ Thomas. Raindrops keep falling on my head, and yeah, I think the world and his wife knows raindrops keep falling on my head. Uh, so this was um, a uh, something from the Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid soundtrack. That was a Western film that obviously came out um, well, on the turn of the decade, late 60s, early 70s. Um, yeah, I've heard this version before. I've not seen the film, but um, his voice sounds familiar enough to know that I'm likely to have heard the B.J. Thomas version, but it's one of those songs that... Um, I mean, you just know it from, like, year dot, really, don't you? From, like, being a little child. Well, maybe not now, you know, perhaps I'm showing my age a bit there, but, you know... I'm not sure my children would definitely know this, but they might do. Yeah, this is, this is quite pleasant. Ah, I've, I've, got, I've got no complaints about this, certainly. And uh, there again, yeah, we've not got to the number one yet, As assuming, I mean, you know, whether you'd have thought, because they played so little of Edison Lighthouse at the start, that because it is this week's number one, that we've got to hear more of it at the end of the show, or near the end. Can't tell you anything about BJ Thomas, um, not sure what became of him what he did prior or since but um, fingers crossed I'll have got enough interesting research to be done for the info at the bottom of the screen possibly singing live though possibly Quite a bit of a jaunty ending to that, I weren't expecting. DJ Thomas, uh, you've probably read in the papers that Peter Morinello has just been signed to Arsenal for the fantastic fee of £100,000. And we're very lucky to have him with us here on Top of the Pops to present tonight's prizes. Over to you, Peter. Hello. Uh, well, you've been chosen as the best dancer here. Uh, what's your name? Linda. Linda, well, uh, congratulations. Uh, I'd like to present you with the record. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, uh, what's your Hi. name? Delia. Uh, well, your eyes are fabulous. Your eyes are fabulous, okay. What's she wearing? Thank you very much there, Peter. And do you know something? We have won, once again, the enemy uh, Top of the Pops Award. It has become number one in the television section, hasn't it, once again? Yes. And from the enemy, I'd like to present for you, Maurice Kinn. Thank you very much. Uh, Tony. Uh, for the fifth consecutive year, Top of the Pops has been voted the best television show, and it gives me... The best music the television show, because Enemy of, was a music paper. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. much. So it's not like it'd be Coronation much. Street in the NME. So. Right Still. <laughs> Here we go. Love Grows Where Rosemary Goes, or I said Love Goes Where Rosemary Grows, you know. Yeah, good song this. Um, this is also on a film, uh, much later than what the song came out. I think this was on Shallow How, if anyone remembers that. It was a Jack Black movie. Also featured Jason Alexander, who played Costanza in Seinfeld. I think that was around sort of 2001, 2002. Um, it was one of those, uh, one of the Farrelly Brothers um, better films. I sort of find them a little bit hit and miss at that point. Um, they, of course, did Dumb and Dumber. And I'm sure this song was on there. Um, good, yeah, good number one. This, uh, I think this is a decent song. Uh, I think my favourite performance tonight, if you can call it a performance, was still Jackson 5, I Want You Back. Enjoyed Billy Preston, even though it wasn't a song of his I was familiar with. Uh, Shocking Blue were good. Uh, Judy Collins, uh, a case of mistaken identity, but I enjoyed her. Um, 
Sandy Shaw was the, that, the person I credited as being Mary Hopkins. You know, um, nothing on this that I would say it was completely bad. Not massively bothered about the Temptations. Um, BJ Thomas was pretty good. Oh, I think this has been a strong edition. But there was a lot of strong music in this era, and I think it's good for me as a music fan to watch this sort of thing from this era and reflect on it and, um, you know, open myself up to new, new slash old musical experiences. Because obviously it's 52 years old, this edition. Wow. And this music, obviously, some of it is uh, from 1969, so we, we're talking many, many decades ago. Um, but it just makes a change. I've done a lot of 1990s um, episodes uh, recently. I intend to do more because the 90s, I think, you know, everyone enjoys generally a lot of stuff from the 90s and... Um, you know, there's particular years in the 1990s that I'm hoping to be able to cover in this series, hopefully, as this year 2022 progresses. But yeah, Edison Lighthouse at number one. Good, good stuff. There you go, number one from Edison Lighthouse. You enjoy yourself? Yes, very That's all we've got for you, I'm afraid. Be back with us at the same time next week, won't you? Thank you very much for watching. Be back with the same time for another edition of Top or the Pops. Bye bye. <laughs> So that was it. That was your Top of the Pops for 52 years ago today, 5th of February 1970. Uh, here we just see, um, I think this is a random, probably the usual Top of the Pops end theme that they would have um, played over the credits at this point, I think. Oh, we only see uh, a very brief credit card come up there. But I um, hope you enjoyed this. Please join me again next time for my next Top of the Pops reaction, which shouldn't be too long, so stay tuned, turn your notifications on, and all that bollards. Cheers, everyone. See ya!